if you're in a relationship where you really want to have this conversation with someone and they don't want to have it with you or they don't respond in the depth that you want or as emotionally articulate as you'd like or as you do you have to accept that this is them he ended up taking the money that he was going to put in the company and buying a ranch instead we're starting on a monday on saturday he called me up it was like Topaz, the money I was going to put in to match the funds you were raising from your friends and family, I'm going to put into a ranch instead. I'm really sorry. And I was like, Night of the Soul, are you really going to go, Topaz? 37 year old, are you really going to do this? And I was scared shitless. And I said, What better story than this? Apparently, everything comes down to 12 questions for love. What are these 12 questions? From 10 years, 1,200 conversations, these 12 questions are. Apparently, everything comes down to 12 questions for love. What is that? What are we talking about? What are these questions? What are some sample questions of these 12 questions for love? So the, the impetus of the book wasn't Skin Deep fan called me up, Jill. She said, Topaz, I've been watching this for a long time. What have you learned from doing this for 10 years, for 1,200 pairs? What are the questions that really work? If you had to dial it down. So I chose the questions I know work, but what's really important is the architecture. Mm -hmm. and we could talk about the questions. Like on a prescriptive level, you buy this book, you're going to have an epic conversation that's going to change your relationship forever, period. And you can have that conversation over and over again because you're changing, your partner is changing, life is changing. You can ask these same 12 questions over and over again. There's also additional questions in the end of the book that you can replace. But what's really fundamental on a macro level is where do we learn how to have really good conversations? We, my answer when I think about that is we model it in our family and maybe our friend groups. Like where do we really, and I'm not talking about seeing something on TV of someone else happening, I'm saying, which, which the and offer is incredibly, but how do you practice in your own life? From 10 years, 1200, watching conversations, but these 12 questions are structured in a certain way and I explore why they work. Um, and where, where do you want to go with it? I mean, you want me to ask, which is my favorite question, or I basically took the 12 questions and I put them in a sequence that I know I've seen work incredibly well. And they take you on a journey. It's like a five act, five act structure. There's the opening that builds a trust and respect. The first three questions that acknowledges the synergy of your relationship. The second three questions explore conflict and the growing conflict and how do we handle it? Seventh and eighth is the peak, is the climax. Seven is what's the pain in me you wish you could heal and why? Number eight is what's one experience you wish I never had, we never had and why? And then we start landing the plane. Nine and 10 are about gratitude and acknowledgement. What are we learning from each other? What are we reflecting to each other? And 11 or 12 are two questions that we should always ask and talk about because the fact of the temporalness of life, right? Number 11 is, if this were to be our last conversation, what's one thing you never want me to forget and why? And number 12 is probably the most profound question that you can really dive deep, especially after this conversation, especially since you've gone through this architecture of the journey that's set. Why do you love me? I would ask, what does love mean? What do you mean by love? When you say, it's like, those are the kind of questions that I like to, so, to hone in on. Totally. Well, I think we can improve that question by saying, because one of the things that people miss out on in the questions that I've learned, the what five things that makes a good question is to acknowledge the connection. Uh -huh. So I would tweak that question. Because if you ask me, what does love mean to me? And you ask someone else, what and if my wife asked me what love means to me and different, I would answer that question the same way. Love means to me this. But if you said Topaz, how do you think we how do you think we feel about love the same or differently? And my wife asked me the same question and someone stranger did. The answer will be different because it acknowledges who I'm talking to, who's asking the question. It, right. it acknowledges the connection. So that's what you mean by it should have a connective POV. Absolutely. So is that how you, you see all questions in general? Like you should, you uh, should questions. The gold standard is for them to have a connective POV. No, well, there's, what I've seen, when I construct a question in the context of a relationship, because I mm. always talk about a book, what to do as an individual to, to yourself, the context of a relationship, I found there's five things. One is don't make it binary. Don't ask questions. Do you love me? Yes, no, done. That's right. not for experience. You know, put things together that don't normally come together. 
Um, how does conflict make us better? We don't often think it's conflict to make us better, right? One of, this connective one is, is one that's often overlooked. It's like if you think about 36, Arthur Aaron's questions, 36 questions for love, I think maybe six or seven of them acknowledge the person who's in the people in conversation. The others are just, I mean, you'll answer the same, th that question regardless of who's asking it. And isn't what we really want to know. If you're meeting a stranger, maybe it's nice to ask these questions. If you really want to know when you're curious about your partner and you want to hear them talk about something that has nothing to do with you, that's totally fine. But in the context of a relationship, of exploring your relationship, you got to ask questions that acknowledge it, that harp on the connection. And then there's two other things we can go into too, but I don't know if that's where you want to go. Yeah, let's talk about that. So uh, a question that empowers and aims for a constructive result, what does that mean? Well, you're setting me up here because you know, I mean, it's like. No, for the listener though, you know. Right, right. But I mean, you know, you, you know it's like, let's talk about meditation for a sec. You know a lot. But one thing I feel about meditation is that it's not the art of not having a thought. It's about the art of letting go of thoughts. It's about letting go, right? It's like letting it go, having it, letting it come through, let it go. And when we ask ourselves questions, our mind is chasing to catch onto something, an answer. Our mind is like the dog that chases the stick. Regardless of where you throw the stick, the dog will chase the stick. The thing that throws the stick is the question. So if I'm going to throw the question into a muddy pond, which is like, why do we fight so much? Okay, the dog's going to get that stick, which is the mind is going to give you the answers. It's going to give you a litany of answers. Well, because we don't match, because we don't respect, whatever. Why do we fight so much? Okay, done. I'm a service to the question. I want to get the stick. I'm going to give you a list of why we fight so much. Why, you why, do, always, why do you never compliment me when I come in? But right, it's like, well, that, 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 it's like, whoa. What if we throw it up? It's like, what's our biggest conflict right now? And what is it teaching us? Mm. That's sending the stick to a different spot. The mind isn't the dog. The mind is now chasing that stick that's going to be a more constructive answer. The question shapes the answer. The course shapes the race it's run on, run on. So we are always asking ourselves questions. We don't realize it. You wake up and you're in a state. Well, because you've asked yourself a question. Stop. Ask a new question. You wake up knowing you're going to have a tough conversation with someone. You are anxious about it. You don't want to do it. What if you stop and go, okay, wait, 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 wait. What's the hidden gift in this conversation? How can this conversation, what's the lesson in this for me so that I can become a better human? Okay. The mind is going to serve the question. The dog will chase the stick. Where you throw the stick, you can control. You just have to be conscientious of the question you're asking. And that's what I mean by making a constructive question. Mm. And uh, uh, let it be unexpected. Well, that's what I was saying about connecting two things that are not, you know, like an individual, I'd say, Light, what's your favorite memory from your worst relationship? Mm -hmm. That's unexpected, mm -hmm. right? Um, how much does earning money cost you? Um, in a context of a relationship, let's make one up now. What, um, you know, how is it that, like I said, how does conflict make us better? But we can come with a, another one, which is connecting two ideas that don't, you don't normally put together. Right? How does us being safe and comfortable make us worse? Mm. Wait, safe and comfortable make us worse? How is that possible? Wait, what? Well, okay, let's explore that. You know, what are we not gaining by being together? Well, shit. Really? But we don't, you know. So connect in another form of that, unexpected, is making a question where it puts you or the other person in someone else's shoes. Mm -hmm. Light, what do you think is the hardest thing being your friend? Mm -hmm. I love these questions, man. <laughs> right, so. I mean, we have tons of them in the, in the editions that we sell and everything, but, and we rake in more and I, the 
questions are door openers. They're keys. They're keys that if you ask, you don't even have to answer it. If you ask, it unlocks a door into a room of your emotional being, in the room of, of, of your relationship, in the home of your relationship, a new room. And sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, let's explore the house. Mm -hmm. How do you create a safe enough external space to really dive in to these questions? What do you recommend for people who are, because who may want to just ask these questions? Are there places, is there a time and place that's not suitable? Absolutely. Um, the, so, so the two things I've learned from this whole thing is that there's two things that are required. One is the space and one is well-constructed questions. We've talked about well-constructed questions. Now mm -hmm. the space. The space does not have to be, um, we don't have to light candles and play soft music. We don't have to do, we don't, that's nice. You can do that. It's great. But it doesn't have to be heavy handed. All it has to do is create the intention in the space so that we understand why we're here. Right? I mean, one thing that happens in relation oftentimes when it builds up intention is that one person goes, we got to talk. And you go, oh, shit, we got to talk. Okay, it's built up enough that one of us is in so much pain, we got to talk. Right? But that creates a space. Like, we're going to have a, a, a certain kind of talk. In our lives, how do we create the space to have certain kinds of conversations? Just like in the rooms of our house. There are certain things you do in the kitchen. And there's different things you do in the bedroom or the bathroom. You're not going to kick. You're not going to. You're not going to cook in in the bathroom, and you're not going to sleep in the kitchen. So how do you create the space to have the way you do it? Is set out intention. Hey, let's play a game. Hey, I got this thing. Twelve questions for love. Hey, let's just make up a thing where we write five questions each on a piece of paper and we read them out loud and just talk about it. Hey. Let's do this thing. Let's go on a road trip. Let's not play a podcast or a song. Let's actually just talk. And we're going to give each other permission to ask the wackiest questions. Because here's the thing. If someone comes to you and says, why do you love me? You're not wondering why you love them. You're wondering why they ask me this while I'm washing the dishes. Right? You're not wondering. You don't, this permission hasn't been granted for one person to receive and one person to give. Or similarly, if you came home to your partner and you were like, my love, I love you so much because ba 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 ba, And they're wondering why you're coming at them, telling them why you love them while they're watching. Where's this coming from? So they're not in the space to receive. Right. Creating the space could simply be, hey, I'd love to have a conversation. Let's create some ground rules. The ground rules are we're going to sit here for half an hour. We're not going to look at our phones. We're going to chill and we're going to go through these five questions. And the rules are you have to ask every question, but you don't have to answer it. Or just create the, the guardrails. And the guardrails can be simple. They don't have to, right? And then in the context of this book, where I have these 12 questions, I say is don't stop in the middle. If you have to end in the middle, go to the last two questions. Because if you stop in questions six, seven, or eight, where there's a lot of, you're in vulnerable space and you have to run out the door because your kids called or they woke up or something happened, you got to yeah. go to a meeting, you're, you're leaving the, the operation on the, on, on the, you know, right down the floor in the surgery room. You got to land up. You got to land a plane. All I'd say is like, bring intention to the conversation you're having. You're not going to, you know, what is this, con is this conversation for us to explore? If it's for us to explore, let's not fight to find a resolution here. It's a different kind of conversation. We're here to talk. We're here to explore. We're here to see what we're at. We're here to learn. Mm -hmm. And whatever answer you give is what you give, even if you don't give an answer. We don't do that often enough. There's so many nutrients in the relationships that are ironically the closest to us. But because they're close to us, we take them in some sense for granted, right? Because they're there. They're always there. Wait, what if I ask a different question to my dad? He's going to answer it in a totally different way because it's, it's a new question. He's never thought about it. And that's going to that's gonna illuminate the, the th one of the threads that we rarely look at or feel in our connection. And what happens after you have that conversation? Man, you got so many hits of dopamine. You got so much enthusiasm for life because your life as a human being has been reflected back to you by another human being. We don't do it enough. We spend more time on our phones and the restaurants because we get these quick, small dopamine hits from getting a DM or swiping, which fair enough, it's addicting. It's how it's built to do. 
but it's giving you small dopamine hits. Put it aside, invest, wait, and, and after a 10-minute conversation, you get even a bigger dopamine hit that you couldn't get from scrolling through the phone. You just got to invest in it. You got to create the space for it. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. Going back to the pre-divorce, you know, you're with Tria and what is it? Ichak? How do you, how do you say your dad's yeah, name? Yeah. Yeah. That is Isaac basically, but yeah, Ichak, yeah. Isaac. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're growing up, you and your brother. Um, earliest memories, what's your favorite toy or activity? Ripping pages out of books, <laughs> ripping pages out of books. My brother and I, I don't know. That's a memory. It's either ripping pages out of books. So we'd sit there as soon as the parents would leave, we'd just open a book and just rip the paper each, you know, just slowly work through the book, just ripping the paper out of the book, just hearing the shh. And the other favorite activity was grabbing a toilet roll. And running through the house, leaving like a trail of the paper, you know, just leaving the trail, just as many as you could. Those are two memories. I have actually didn't think about that until you asked the question. So thanks for asking. Now, is ripping pages kind of like those AMSR videos where maybe, it's just, maybe it's, that's what it is. I didn't even think about it until now. Hear it tear out of the book, or is it because you have therapists for parents and they were, yeah, were like psychoanalyzing you and your other? We, we, maybe, only my on. mom is a is a therapist. My dad's more of a. He's in the business world, but he is basically an organizational therapist, right? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's those are the two memories that I really remember before divorce, because basically my childhood was informed by the divorce. That's really what I remember, right? Um, so, and what was yeah. the ideology in your household? Like, what was a dominant uh, philosophy? I know I've heard you say in a other interview it was something about you know what's the value of what you're doing, but maybe you can mm. talk a little more about that or maybe give a little more context to what that even means. Well, I mean, I have to give credit to my parents. I definitely give credit to my parents. I give credit to my parents because they've they have changed a lot. So it's interesting when I talk about the past. I'm talking about parents who have changed. They're not who they are now than they were then. Especially my father. My father's done a lot of incredible work on himself and explored him. He's one of the most impressive souls I've ever come across. But back then, um, I remember my dad saying, don't be a parasite. Mm. Like that was the, that was the big negative word, a parasite. Someone who lives off, an, you know, um, an entity that lives off someone else and doesn't contribute and doesn't just takes. I just remember that was the thing. Like, don't leave your, you know, if you, don't leave a mess in the room because, you know, don't be a parasite. Don't, you know, don't order extra food and leave it on the table because you know, no, we're not. So that was that, that, that line, don't be a parasite maybe is the underlying, the underlying question of that is how you're adding value, right? How are you contributing, not just taking? So mm -hmm. I said, that was a, a key one. Um, my mom's from my mom, it was about being a class act. Um, well, it was two things. One was about being a class act. And she had the line back then, this will date me, but there was, I don't know if you remember, I don't know how old you are, but I don't know if you remember watching a Vidal Sassoon commercials, where it's like, if we don't look good, you don't look good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my mom would tell me that when we go over to someone's house or sleep over, she's like, remember, if you don't look good, I don't look good. I was like, okay, we better behave because we got to make mama look good, right? In terms of just being a class act. So I think that's something that my mom definitely instilled. And my mom also instilled in me because she was a therapist and Work with a lot of, uh, she still does with people who are of low income or are immigrants because she speaks three, four languages herself. Um, it's about helping others. You know, I remember you see a homeless man, a man on the street. What can we do for him? Can we give him the banana that's in the car? Can we feed him? What? I, that was a very early memory. It was like, how can we take care of others? How can we help others? Um, and being a class act. I think a lasting legacy from my parents into this age is my father with passion, a very passionate man for the things he loves, which is basically his work, which he doesn't call work because he loves it. And if you're working, if you do what you love, you're not working. And for my mom, it's uh, integrity. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So I read about this story about you dictating these, this contract with your dad, you kind of open your book with this. Can you, uh, cause I think this does a really good job of just contextualizing, um, how you became interested in what you're doing now. And I'd love for you to just kind of share that experience with my audience. Okay. Well, this was a profound kind of experience in my life memory that probably until I was 37 was the anchor of my identity, right? Where, and that identity was that of kind of one of a victim of kind of, you know, woe is me. And, and, um, and it's just a story that I really identified with. And it was basically, you know, I was young. My parents got, I, I, I remember divorce as a young, I was, my brother's 15 months younger than I. I don't know exactly when they got divorced because I'm a little, but I was preschool and I remember fights and we were in the middle of that, you know, you're, as a child, you're, you're watching two giants going at it, yelling at each other, you know, and that can be pretty terrifying, um, earth shaking, you know, we all have our traumas. Victor Frankl says it's the question is, it's not a comparison of trauma. It's just how are you handling it? It's not like, you know, I'm not here suggesting just for me, that was mine. And and one day we're playing my brother and I in my dad's house and my dad came in and said, look, your mom wants to take you for a ho this holiday coming up right now, for, you know, and uh, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, why don't you just make up a contract? Well, what, the, what should the contract say? Well, just, you know, if make a deal, you know, if she takes us now, you, sh you get us for the next holiday. That's my memory. And he wrote down and whatnot. Now, my dad in reading this is a little bit, Man, this makes me look like an asshole, Topa. What the, you know, I'm like, Dad, maybe this didn't even happen, but that's my memory, right? And I do, we all know memories, sh memories don't lie per se, but they shift and they change, right? They feed a certain narrative of whatever stage of life you're in. You're utilizing that narrative for something. So that was, that's my memory. And for a long time, the memory is then my mom shows up and my dad's like, sign the contract. And my mom's like, no. And she, we basically did this merry-go-round. And I remember it was a misty night. Car pulls out. My mom had this old yellow Oldsmobile, like from the classic 80s. Like, and misty. I remember the mist hanging in the air and the lights reflecting on the mist and just the car engine running and then the hum of it. And then my mom grabbing my brother, who's 15 months younger, is probably two and a half, putting him in the baby seat. He's crying because my dad is then yelling at her not to do that. Then he goes to the car to grab her. my brother out. Well, she goes to get me, to put me in the car, but then my brother's out. So she goes to get my brother and then my dad gets me pulling us and yanking. And, and I'm just saying, just sign the contract, just make the deal. Let's end this. And my mom was quite strong woman, emotionally strong woman, physically too. You know, she didn't get emotional. My dad was really beside himself and me and my brother were tears. I don't know if, you know, as a kid, you know, you had that memory as a kid of, the warm tears on your face, you know, like we don't really get that as adults as much or like that, the warmth of the tears, you know, warming the cheeks up. I, that's a memory. And anyways, we finally, my mom finally drove off with both of us. And when we got to the stoplight and was waiting to turn green, that's when I started her here under my mom's breath. She was sobbing. And that's when something really hit me. Like some, it was like a, clink in the armor of childhood it was just like benchmark this moment anchor this moment there's some like some and i think that's where the seed was laid fundamentally for me about searching for something more of connection what's wrong here right what's wrong between two people who loved each other enough to have two children but then now three years later they they have a war in front of their kids and that's just an extension look at the world where just or it's just a bigger extension of what we have at home in some sense, mm -hmm. you know, our inability to connect and listen and find a way through. What would you say as you became a little bit older, teenager and all that, and you're looking at your mom, your dad, stepmom, and what would you say your idea of success was? And what, what did you what, envision what, yourself becoming as you were, you know, as, as an adult? This is now, this is teenage version of that. Um, until, well, in my teens, I had no idea. I just had, I just had a, I think I had a, 
sense that I was special fed on by an ego because I had a cool name named Topaz. Mm -hmm. Right. So think about it. every new soul you meet is like, oh, Topaz. Oh, right. So if that's your mirror reflection of every new soul you meet as a young, you say, well, I must be cool or special or something because look at the reaction I get, Topaz. Right. It's like, ooh, different. Okay. So I think I had an aloofness to myself. I think I like to play like a philosopher. I ended up going to study philosophy and I, was, I, don't, I wasn't very good at it per se, but I enjoyed it a lot. I think. In my 20s and 30s, I, I attached, well, in my teens, I, I don't think I knew. I just, I, I knew I loved soccer. It's probably one of the only, I was super shy. I went from a small Jewish school of 80 people in three grades to a public high school of 2,500 students. You know, I went from a class that had like 20, 30 kids in a class to five, a grade to 500, right? To like a homogeneous group of kids to an absolutely Santa Monica high school, totally mixed. And I'm so glad I did that. And I didn't talk. I didn't talk for, um, I didn't talk for until junior year, really. And I remember being in Spanish class where you had to talk because she'd be like, Jose, you know, that was my name in class where I'm Jose, como estas? And I, because I it was third period, I hadn't talked. My, I was verklempt, you know, I was like mucus in my, like, uh, 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 and I'm like, just super shy. Super shy, super introverted. I would say I didn't even come out of my shell until the end of junior year of high school. Mm -hmm. And give us a little montage of kind of how you found your way from there into your 20s and 30s. Um, which, which where, where to pull? I want to pull what maybe relates us. Mm -hmm. Not exactly, because I think you did a different time with Travel Light. And I'm not even sure exactly, because I haven't had a chance to read your book yet. But just you talking about is when I graduate university, well, at Berkeley, studying philosophy and all that, and I, I went to, I went to work with a good friend of mine who had a software company out of Sweden. He's still a brother of mine, and he came and we we're doing this business, software-based knowledge. I didn't know anything about technology, but I was like, I'm not going to go work at a consulting firm like everyone else. I'm going to work with this cat for a year, and then I'm going to go traveling. Right? I'm going to save up cash. I'm going to go travel. Three months in, he's like, I got to go back to Sweden because the company's falling apart and you got to stay here and run it. And then I'm there and I realize I'm three hours from Silicon Valley, which is the mecca of this. I have no idea what I'm doing, what I'm talking about. I'm not even passionate about it. What the fuck am I doing? This is no, right? A year later, they end up selling the company for like $35 billion. Maybe I would have had three in the pocket. Right. And I, I always see that as a great, when it happened, I said, this is a great story. Right. Um, it wasn't meant to be, it wasn't my path. My path was the calculation was I'm healthy. My parents are healthy. I have a college education. I don't have college debt. If I ever have to go work for some, if I, if I fall on my ass, I can go work for my dad. Mm -hmm. I am point, this is 1999. I am 0.0001% of the global population who has this luxury to choose. What am I gonna do with it? Like, I am lucky. I am so lucky, right? How am I gonna make the most of this? I wanna, and maybe that's an, the, the fundamental question of that is, what question am I gonna ask myself that I'm gonna pursue for the next 20, 30 years? Well, in order to search for the question, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go for two and a half years till I'm 25. And I'm giving myself the time to explore. Now, how am I gonna explore? So. It becomes a beautiful story. My family had a restaurant in Santa Barbara called Bistro Med at the time. And I was managing the front of the end. That's funny. My dad just one day called and said, Topaz, you got to go in. I'm like, well, I'm doing it. Like, no, you go. it's like a family thing. My dad's from Macedonia. And he's like, son, you're going in right now. Don't bullshit me. The family obligation, step up. It's like, okay. And I went in and I had bartended before and I had waited tables and bust everywhere I worked. So I knew the restaurant. I was like, and I was even interested in it. And I went in and I was working at this restaurant. And then at night we'd go out, obviously, and we'd go to this place. And in the club was this 45-year-old guy looking like Al Green or Stevie Wonder because he had these glasses. Big black dude. And he was just in his world jamming. And I went up to him and I said, in the dance floor, I was like, what do you see? What are you seeing? And he looks at me. 
And that led off this friendship that only lasted three months, four months. But he laid seeds in me about that the reality that we see is not just what we see on the surface. There are things underneath the surface. You know, and I'd read, I came across like The Alchemist in the, in the bookstore and I read it right there and then just because back then I would just walk through a bookstore and I had a question. And I had a question, I would just walk through the bookstore and whatever book drew my attention, I'd grab it. And one day The Alchemist, I didn't even know what it was, drew my attention, I spot it, I sat there in Barnes & Noble on Thirsty Promenade and read it in three hours. And there's a part in the book where it goes, there's a, he's there and he doesn't know if he should go to Africa, the main character, and he's in southern Spain and he sits in the park and the guy reveals himself, he's like a king and says, go follow your path. And this guy, his name was Bob, became my character in my life like that. The king, you know. And he, he kind of woke up for me this thing that life is, on one level, it's, you know, we're doing these physical things, but it's actually a spiritual journey. And we would have, when we'd close up the restaurant, we'd have, sit there for two, three hours just chatting. And it would go by like that. And so I bought a one-way ticket to Australia. I was like, what am I going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for two and a half years. And the way I'm going to live this, I'm just going to follow the signs. The signs are my intuition. And that could be kind of ridiculous because you tell your friends, you're like, what are you talking about? You know, you, you know I, this, the signs would be you wake up in the morning and you say, okay, get on that bus. All right, get off here. Go left. Sorry, I, I think I'm ranting too long, but that's the space I was in. It led me to certain places. Does, I don't know if that resonates for you or not, but... Um, 100%. I mean, I mean, The Alchemist is, was key to my journey. Key. And one of my favorite parts is the crystal shop. You know, when he loses everything and he goes and, and begs the guy for a job at the crystal shop and the guy doesn't want to hire him. So he just picked up the broom and just starts sweeping and cleaning stuff. Mm -hmm. He starts so useful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then a little while later, he gets the job and, and he ends up introducing this tea service because the crystal shop is at the top of this long hill that people have to climb to get to it. And that ends up being the thing that basically revives it. And it was just, for me, it was like, man, you can just create abundance anywhere. And if you're doing it for the right reasons and you're doing it to help other people and to serve, then you're never going to be out of a job. You're always going to have everything mm. you need. And that absolutely has been a part of my, um, my whole, you know, worldview of traveling, not making plans, just getting a one-way ticket somewhere, you know, not even speaking the language, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also a book, I don't know if you read, did you read Autobiography of a Yogi? Y yes. Yeah. Same Lit kind of thing, you know, when he goes on those trips with his buddy and he says, don't worry about it. We don't need money. We don't need, we don't need anything. <laughs> well, that, that informed because this journey that I was on at that, that time left, left in the end of 99 ended with me at the Hela Kumbh Mela in 2001 of January, which there's the Kumbh Mela that happens once every three years in four different cities. So it's every three years, it just rotates. So it goes back to the same city every 12. But 12 times 12 is the Hela Kumbh Mela. It's the last this year. The, but up. that's the Kumbh Mela. Yeah. There's like that, there's, you know, not to consider, but there's one that happens every 144. And that was the one that happened in January of 2001 or two, yeah, 2001. Okay. Around then. Anyhow, that experience in that space is what laid, really was the breaking point for me to start making films. And the dreams I had, the conversations I had, and it was like the payoff of this journey. Because in the West, if you say, I'm going to be a, I'm going to walk the streets. I'm not going to make money. I'm going to follow the signs and I'm going to see how the universe holds me. They would call you a bum. You're homeless. But in India, you're a, you're a um, sadhu. And all you do is you walk with your saffron robe and you carry a little pail to make some tea. And you trust that the universe will carry you. You have and it's no interesting. universe is going to carry you. Yeah. You're just, you're just, that's just your way of being. Being, right? And families, if you choose to not be a sadhu, but be a family member, when you see a sadhu, it's your responsibility to help them, right? And we don't have that in the West. And when I saw that as a young man, I said, oh, wait. 
So this thing I've been on, kind of following the signs, it is a spiritual journey that is rooted in something longer than just me being like, this is in India. And just because I wasn't raised in India and I don't, like this is a valid journey to take, right? But we don't support those in the West because we're so productive oriented. What are you doing? How are you? And I'm really speaking about the time then. I think it's shifted now. But in 1999, when I was coming of age, 22, and like embarking into the world, that wasn't really like a valid main, you know, it wasn't spoken as like it was before now, right? Because now we have the internet where there are those ideas that come to light, the service you're doing, right? I was known growing up, I was known as the question asker. I was always asking questions. A lot of times it would annoy people. Um, because I would ask questions that seemed like they had obvious answers and people would think I was asking because I knew the answer, but the reality was I didn't know the answer. I, I genuinely wanted to know. And I'm also famous in my friend circle for asking questions, like hypothetical questions, and then people will answer it. And then they'll ask me the same question and I'm just, I'm completely stumped. I have no idea <laughs> what the answer is. Like what? Like, like give me an example of a question. Back then. Oh, uh, so light isn't my birth name. Light was a name that, um, I took on in 2005 and it was actually born out of a conversation where I was asking my buddy, my really good friend, um, a question. I was living in LA and, um, you know, LA is a place where people change their names and they rebrand themselves all the time. And I've been meeting all these people with these unique names. Um, and. So I was, I was in the farmer's market on Fairfax and third with my buddy. We were having lunch at the little French restaurant. And, and I said, Hey, you know, I met this guy named mother. I met this guy named, um, truth. And I just listed all these people that I met who had changed their names. And I said, if you had to change your name to a word from the dictionary, <laughs> what would you change it to? And he thought about it for maybe three seconds and just said, ocean. And he goes, what would you change your name to? I was like, I don't know. He goes, well, what's the first thing that comes to mind? It's like, nothing, nothing's coming to mind. I'm really trying here. And I can't think of anything that I would want to be known as for the rest of my life. And, uh, and he starts counting down five, four, three, two, one. And I just blurted out light. And that's where light came from. It came from that conversation, but yeah, I've had several conversations like that, where I will ask people things like that. Like, would you rather questions type of a thing? And then not having the answer for myself, which is a bit of an oddity, but anyway, about wait, wait, you. Wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go wait, ahead. We could, but I got two questions for you. One is why do you think you were so good at asking questions? You know, for me, I can, and I asked that because. For me, it was a search of like connection because I didn't feel it in my life. So mm -hmm. I was asking questions because then I could feel closer to someone. I have a friend, Jeff Wetzer. He has a beautiful book coming out in May called Ask. And he, he told me, it's interesting, he's also a great question asker. But he said, the reason I'm good at questions is because I'm Jewish and I grew up in Connecticut where they didn't really like us. They didn't like me. And, they, and, I, and I had anti-Semitism all the time. So I realized that if I ask people questions, it put the attention on them. And it was my way of hiding. Mm. I found that really interesting, right? So do you, have you, is there, if you had, what, I'm just curious why you think, why was it that you were so good at questions? I've always been um, an observer. I love people watching ever from, from very early age. In fact, I didn't win very many awards in school, but the one award that I would consistently win over and over and over was perfect attendance. I never missed school because I just love being there and the whole social experiment of watching people and, and then wondering, why do they do this? Why does this person, why do they wear that? So I would ask questions like, does anybody even pay attention to what we wear every day? And then that would lead to an experiment of, what would happen if I wore the same right. thing every day for a week? Would somebody even notice? And if they did notice, would they say anything? So then I would run that experiment <laughs> and find out that actually nobody even cares. So, so maybe I don't need this diversity of 
a wardrobe. Maybe I'll just kind of create a capsule wardrobe before I even knew what that was. And um, yeah, just little things like that, you know? And, uh, but what I realized was that most people weren't as curious as I was. I grew up in, this, in Alabama where we would go yeah. to church every Sunday and I'll be sitting there listening to these stories, people walking on water and people rising from the dead. And I'm just like, what is, how does this happen? And nobody had any good answers for me, but, and why is that guy white if he's from the Middle East? And, you know, all these questions that people, and I found that fascinating. So, so I would, I would favor questions that I felt like would make people uncomfortable, you know, in a way, because it was a way of kind of learning about not just the answer to the question, but really about people. I just love learning about people and what, where their sort of, where their boundaries were, you know? Mm -hmm. So me changing my name was, it's never, it was never anything that I wanted to do. It was a boundary of mine. And I was like, why am I afraid to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what happens if I go beyond that boundary? I wonder right. what would happen up. So let's talk about, that's the second point. Let's talk about naming things, the name of things. You change your name that give you other permissions, right? It's like you put on, not another costume, but it gave you other oppor What? Well, okay, maybe, maybe not. I'm sorry if I put these words, but by giving yourself another name gives you other opportunities. When I was 37 and I let go of this identity with the, that I had at that point in terms of my life goal, which was to tell my father's story of the world of the Holocaust and everything. When I let that go, which was basically brooding the identity of a film director, I call myself a film director. Then I created a new name for myself or like who I was, which was a story breaker. It gave me a new opportunity, new possibilities. Just like, so I assume like you call yourself light. It's different than what your name was before. New possibilities emerge. So what we name things is so important. That's why when I name my kids, we really put a lot of thought in it because it, names can be maps. Talk about that. Cosmos and Lila. Well, why those names? No, my, my son is, my son is Cosmos Ilan. And which means Ilan means tree in Hebrew. And like, I have this tattoo, right? So there's a horizon, there's a horizon line. Mm -hmm. There's the roots of the tree and there's the cosmos, the stars. If you do Tai Chi, Qigong, you know that we human beings are these entities pulled between the cosmos and the earth. And I wanted to give my son, because, you know, who he's going to be, that's him. I'm just here to support his journey. But what I can do is, and he can change his name and he's totally open. I mean, when he's of age, he can do whatever he wants. I'll support it. But at least in the initial, he know where his parents came from, which was son. There is an eternal truth, which is we are pulled from the cosmos and from the earth and let's not lose our place. And then when our daughter came around, we had, I wanted to find another truth that we could share with her, but also that connected her name to her brother. Because I've had this beautiful experience where my father gifted me with this beautiful name. My mother gifted me with his name, Topaz. And I go, oh, Topaz. And there's a script. Topaz, what is that? Your parents hippies? What's with the hell? Your brother named Diamond? And like, actually, Diamond's my grandmother. <laughs> oh, really? What else you got? I was like, well, my other brother is Onyx and my other brother is Sapphire. I love it. Right? So every new soul that I'd meet would send energetic waves to my two brothers and my grandmother, regardless of whether I like them or not. Or they're, my grandmother passed a long time ago. But every time I have that conversation, every new soul I meet, it's like, boom, program, energies to remind. And I have other siblings, but I, there's no context to talk about them because they don't have the same name. Or the same like stone, it's not part of the story. So I realized the power of naming things, not only map, but can connect people to things. So mm. when, and wait, I should, the truth is also is that Cosmos came because my wife, we had a miscarriage in New Zealand. And a few months later, a year later, my wife came home and said, if we have another kid, we should name him Cosmos. And I'm like, done. Because my wife is, you know, We've been listening to the patriarchy for way too long. Now I'm serving the matriarchy and my wife is the bomb. And she says that I'm like of service to that. So I contribute the Elan because we have to balance it, you know, earth and sky. 
So my wife, when we, had, we found out we had a baby daughter coming, she's like, Oceana, which is the feminine ocean. Because you say Oceano. She says, Oceana. So I think, fuck, how do we ground the ocean? How do you ground? You can't ground the ocean. It's the deep, the biggest mass in the world. And how deep is it? So deep you can't. And um, then it hit me. It was like, wait, you don't, you, you can navigate the ocean. Mm. So when do you navigate the ocean? At night. And Lila. I always loved Arabic names. I was like, Lila, night ocean. So she knows, don't be scared of the dark. That's where you see the light. And you can find things in the dark that you can't find in the light. Because when you're traversing across the ocean in the daytime, I mean, I'm not a mariner. I'm not, you know, someone who's, but it's at night that you know where you're going because you see the stars. And that can be a map for her. And also, when do you see the cosmos at night? And the earth is Elan, the tree. And ocean is the feminine, it's the ocean. So you have the ocean and the earth and you have the night. So all this connection between, just by the naming, you know, but I think how does it pertain to anyone listening is just, what do we call ourselves? What we call ourselves gives us permission, gives us possibilities that didn't exist before. You know? And even more so, the question, mm -hmm. what's in a name, is something that maybe we want to consider, even for ourselves. Even now, you may have had the name you have, you've had for decades, but you don't have to keep that name if you don't want. If well, you feel like connected if you, if you feel like it's not aligned with who and what you are or what's emerging through you i'm living proof you can change your name anytime you right. but you also have you there are things also in your name that you may not realize or recognize until you really look at them example i spent a lot a fair amount of time in new zealand um and i'm really moved by the maori community the maori culture and i have a good friend there named tamaho ro and we're sitting in this place in the Wanganui River, and Wanganui has legal personhood. It's one of the first countries that gives legal personhood to bodies of water. And we're sitting there, and he's talking about how his ancestors come from this land, and they know every, not just the name of the river, but every stream within the river. Every eddy has a name. It's personified. It's a being. We need to treat it as such. You know, and he's, you know, he knows his seven, he knows what waka his line came on, the boat that is. He knows his past. And if you know your past, then you're obviously thinking about the future because soon you'll be part of the past. And I'm sitting there where it was sun is setting and I go, well, yeah, that's beautiful, but I don't really have a name that's connected to nature, you know? And, and then I realized, wait, Topaz. And I, I'm, at this point, I'm like 30, I'm 40 years old. And I go, wait a second, Topaz. And I'm saying, wait, that's not true. My last name is Adiges, which is the name of a river in Italy. Adige, where you get their Pinot Grigio. Alto Adige. I'm like, I'm named after a river, God damn it. I'm named after a river. And I didn't recognize it. And Tamaho looked at me, he's like, maybe you need to go visit the river. Did you? you know? No. <laughs> Not yet. I mean, I've been through it because I was in Italy, but we didn't, I didn't visit the river. I didn't go sit down at the, with my mom and my wife and we had, we are in Florence. We didn't make that. No, we didn't. But that's clearly something that should be done. So t tell me a little bit more about your relationship with questions. What was the question you were answering when you became a filmmaker for yourself? When I was, um, at some point I was living in Sweden. I was, I don't know, 25. And I wanted to, I did, after traveling and following the signs and having conversations, I always carried a camera with me. And I just would interview and talk to people with this camera and ask them questions. And then at some point I said, okay, I think this how is what I wanted. You, how would you approach people? I'm sure you developed like a little. I, I wasn't even people on the street. When you're backpacking, I mean, I would do what you would do. I would walk into a restaurant and I see that they had one busser and the kitchen guy wasn't there and it was piled up. And I just would start bussing and I'd go in the kitchen and start cleaning for my meal yeah. and I would just start doing exactly the crystal story. I've done that so many times. Cause, and they'd be like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, you know, I'm helping out. And then obviously they give you a meal or maybe they invite you back for a job or I was moving antique furniture. I was, and I would meet people. And it's that. I wouldn't necessarily walk up to people on the street. Um, 
And I had, and I could tell you, my life has been littered with beautiful signs from the universe. And I, and where you're just like, really? That you'd be laughing at that point. When I show my friends a sign that led me to Uruguay, they just laugh. They're just like, of course, because they're laughing because of how obvious the sign is. It's just like, how could, you know, this guy, like, just, just the signs. Now, I don't always follow the signs. Sometimes you get in your rhythm, you're like focused, you know. But when you open yourself up, in one of your videos, you're talking about like how you like to take a break during the day and not be focused, to like let life unveil itself. That's when you can let go and create the opening. When you don't know the answer and you are, have the question, but you're, because you don't know the answer, that's when the signs can come in, right? And that's how I went with my filmmaking. You know, when you are progressing like this on an answer, you don't, you can miss the answer. The, 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 you think that's the answer. That's what I'm doing. You miss the possible beautiful answers that really exist. This flies into the face of, you know, convention, obviously, because you look around now, especially online and, you know, you get all these, these really wealthy people talking about how much you have to focus and you have to be one dimensional, you know, have one direction and, and you have to, uh, have a plan mm -hmm. and be efficient with your time, make the most life hack. Yeah, exactly. So my thing to that is just what was the question we're asking ourselves? And a lot of the questions that we ask ourselves are societal programming, right? I just got off the phone with someone before who's this amazing astrologer. She's brilliant and people love her and she's growing fast. And she asked me, well, I want to go exponential and I want to work smarter, not harder. I'm like, whoa, whoa okay. Let's not talk about what you want, where you're going. Let's just talk about the question. Because why do you want to go exponential? Why? So, you know, entrepreneurs, they start a company and the first thing they're always talking about uh, an exit, scale, scale to exit. Why? Why do you want to scale, scale to exit? People talk about changing a billion people's lives. Why do you want to change a billion people's lives? Why not change one? Just one. Forget a billion. What? A lot of us are, there is a side of programming that we take on and we are, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying we should be aware of it so that we can ask ourselves better questions, so that we can take our souls on more interesting journeys. Jerry Seinfeld, he floats this question to himself a lot. He says, to what end? To what end? So when they talk about, you know, Jerry, do you want to extend the, Sein the Seinfeld show again? We'll give you $10 million an episode. He goes, to what end? Like, is this going to make me happier having another extra $100 million? Got yeah. all the money in the world. Why would I do this? Is it about the quality of the experience or is it just about the outcome of the experience? And I think that's what you're alluding to is if you're making decisions based on outcomes, then you're really setting yourself up for that, for the wealthy rat race, you know, because you're still going to get to a point, a hundred million dollars exit later where you're thinking, well, what's next? You know, yeah. I still don't have enough versus being process oriented, focusing on whatever's happening in the moment, being fully there asking yourself those questions, what more can I see in this moment? What more can I extract from this experience? And then in the process, cultivating fulfillment inside, in which case you get to a point where you're not asking what's next. You're asking yourself, um, what more can I be in this moment? Mm -hmm. These are the questions. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that I find really helpful are question loops. The most famous question loop is why? Asking it six times over, why? Da, 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 da. Why? Da, 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 da. But another interesting question that I like to ask is why? What if? What will it give it? What will it give me? What if I already have it? Why? What will it give me? What if I already have it? Right. So some of us are chasing after something that's going to give. Like you have. What? Why do you want to make so much money? So I have financial freedom. Okay. Do you have financial freedom now? Well, why do you want financial freedom? So I have time. Well, do you have time now? So I can impact people's lives. Are you impacting people's lives now? Are you already doing that? Just, and, and it's not to give the answer. It's to find a deeper question that's worthwhile answering that can empower you that moves away from the societal programming that's on the surface. Did you learn to approach life and questions like that just through your travels or did you read a book about questions or what? what no, no, I think, I think, I think it goes back to your kid or three. I don't know. I can just tell you that as a very young person, I wanted to talk to people 
because I think I was, I didn't experience intimacy in the sense that I knew there was something more. And maybe, you know, as a young kid, you're three years old and you see these giants that you love, these gods, you know, you see, you see these gods, your parents are gods, right? Because they don't do anything wrong. I mean, at, at, from that perspective of a three-year-old, right? Fighting. And you just feel like that, I have to, I have to tap into some deeper knowledge here to survive. And then I know there's a connection here. Like, where is it? How do I find it? And then, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I can't tell you how. I don't know. I just think a lot. <laughs> I think a lot and I love to dance. I love like five rhythms dance. I love to get out of the head into the body because the body obviously tells you a lot, but you can have conversations with the body, right? There's a lot that's in the body that talk, speaks to you. And anyhow, yeah. Where were you when that name, the and occurred to you? And how did you know that was the right name for it? Well, so when I, the Skin Deep is an experience design studio that I launched in January of 2014. A few months prior, a friend of mine reached out. He wanted to make a documentary about why good looking people get ahead in America. Like in a world of meritocracy, why do good looking people get ahead? I said, and he had, he wanted to put money in. So as a filmmaker at the time, I'm like, cool. Okay, hold on. Let me get back to you. And I came back to him with the idea and he called it the Skin Deep. So I took the name of Skin Deep and I said, look, what's really interesting is not why good looking people. What's really interesting is how is the emotional experience of being human shifting in lieu of digital changes that are happening? That's what's interesting. Let's, and we're going to create an experience design studio. We're not going to make a film. We're going to create experiences because if you really want to impact people, it's not through films, it's through digital content because I had this, you know, and he ended up uh, taking the money that he was going to put in the company and buying a ranch instead, which was a hidden blessing. And it was a real, that was on a, we we're starting on a Monday on Saturday. He called me up. He's like, Topaz, the money I was going to put in to match the funds you were raising from your friends and family. I'm going to put it into a ranch and said, I'm really sorry. And he was really kind about it. And okay. And I was like, night of the soul. Are you really going to go Topaz? 37 year old. Are you really going to do this? I said, this is, and I was scared shitless. And I said, what better story than this? Like, this is a good, it's kind of like that story I told you about the software company and a year later sold it for 30, but I would have had three. I was like, this is a great story, right? I want to be telling the story. In the future, like two days before the guy pulls his cat and I'm going to work with the first two hires, Paige and Haran, and I'm shitting a brick because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know what the product is and I'm taking my friend's family money and half the money's gone. Great story. What's the question? The question is, how's the emotional experience of being human shape shifting in the digital landscape of, uh, the shifting landscape of technology and how we're living? And then I would get my friends together and pause and just ask questions like, how is that it out? And one of them, and then we were thinking about what's the name of the company? What's it? And I have a good friend, Nathan Phillips, who's a brilliant, brilliant creator. He's one of the smartest guys, brilliant guys I've ever met. And he helped me with the launching the, because I created the video of these conversations, triptych and everything. All right. But I went to him and June Harada, two good friends who are brilliant. And they said, stop, let's not put this on YouTube. Let's create it a digital experience, an interactive experience. And Nathan was brilliant in that. And we thought, what are we going to name it? And we had been, we even thought about the and for the experience design studio. And ultimately one day he says, and I'm easy with names. I don't spend a lot of time in names. I'm horrible with names. I mean, as you said, everything is the, the skin deep, the and, the dig. You know, I have a thing called grace. Um, the window is all these things we created. So she said, the end, the space between. I'm like, perfect. And that's how we did it. And, and really the end speaks about the space between. I always carry these magnets around and we bring magnets together. You can feel the energy between them, right? If you flip, flip one over, you feel the push or the pull. Before they touch, you can feel that, but you don't see anything, but you feel it. That energy exists between all of us. And not only us as humans, but nature. There's that energy. Like, how can we illuminate it? And that's the endeavor of the end is by having these conversations, filming with two always showing both faces at the same time, you could see the threads that bind us and we can amplify humanity that way by putting it. Yeah. 
I know that you suspected that this was a great idea and that resonate with a lot of people, but at what point did you know, okay, this, we've got something here. Um, we did an experiment where we brought people in a room and we filmed them and we just did an experiment. And then when I directed, I didn't have a monitor to see both faces at the same time, just for the audience. The and is, is always two people in a room facing each other, asking questions that we give them. And we film it with three cameras. One's a wide shot and the other two are close-ups on their faces. So you're always seeing both faces at the same time. When we first watched in, I was with Chris McNabb in the editor room. He's our editor at the time. And he just lined it up and we watched a simple conversation. And I looked at him, he looked at me, he was like, oh my God, we got gold. This is amazing. We're seeing both faces. And why is it amazing? It's 2014. Why is it amazing? Why I thought it was amazing and still do is because if you think about all the content we watch, a lot of it, whether it's a film, social media, anything, you're always seeing the person talking. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing the receiver. We are not elevating the listener. What you practice, you get good at. Are we practicing listening as an individual, as a society, as an organization? Do we practice listening? One, one example of that is like, well, what's the content we watch? We're watching people talking to us. We're listening, but we don't see someone else listening. We're not elevating... And in the end, we elevate the listener to be as important as a speaker. And therefore, we're saying what's important here is their connection. What's important is your connection. Right? Would you give them instructions on, hey, no. this is what we're to the, want as to practice listening? Oh, no, listening. no, 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 no. The space is theirs. That's number one rule. This is your space. So There's if I'm no, showing up to be a part of this. Oh, I can't I wait. I, was that, do I know the other person or is it? Oh yeah. So blind? unless you're doing a blind date, unless you're doing a blind date, you always, you always have a connection because the, the end is about the space between. It's about our connection. A relationship is not you or I, it's you and I. So it's the mm -hmm. and, right? So if you're with a stranger who you don't know and there's no romantic interest, you're not really invested. Right? You're not necessarily as invested if you're talking to your mom, to your brother, to your best friend. You know, even on a blind date, you're somewhat invested because is there some kind of chemistry here? Right? So there what's really important at the end is is the relationship between them and that they have the opportunity to have a cathartic conversation if they so choose. And us as a viewers, because we get to see both faces, even if they don't answer and because the rule of the end is one of the rules is that you don't have to you have to ask every question, but you do not have to answer anything you don't want. Mm. You have the, you, we like to say that a, we create the space for humans to be humans. And part of that is you don't have to answer the question if you don't want, but let's ask the question. And as a viewer, you get to watch them ask the question and you're projecting, even if they don't answer, say, let's talk about it at home. You are projecting what you think they would say, what they're not saying, why they're not saying, what you would say in that situation. You're still having the conversation for yourself and they're having it for sure between them, even though they're not articulating it. Um, and so what's really imperative in the end is to create space for humans to be humans and to accept that. And that goes into a relationship. If you're in a relationship where you really want to have this conversation with someone and they don't want to have it with you, or let's say this, that's one problem. And maybe there's other aspects of your relationship that they don't want to participate in, but say they do have a conversation with you but they don't respond in the depth that you want or as emotionally articulate as you'd like or as you do. You have to accept that. This is them. They are them. Don't bring the judgment. Let them be who they are and let them be in the space. The fact they're in the space with you is enough. And then obviously you want to keep having these conversations because then they can become more, better practice at it. Right? And they can explore more courageously their vulnerability and such. But I think that's a big part of these conversations is no agenda. Coming to it again, like we said, like open open space. When you and your uh, partner looked at each other and said, we've got gold, was that in 2000? Oh, no, no, no. That was Chris McNabb, who was our editor, when we looked okay. at each other. He lined it up. Was that early on in the process? Did oh, you yeah. Already, the format and everything? Or you knew you, you already had all this, you don't have to answer the question and did the whole thing? Oh, yeah. Uh, not, I mean, I, I polished the introductory, like how we welcome the people in and what I said. But the rules were pretty clear from the get-go. We're going to have people facing each other. 
going to ask each other questions and that's it. We're going to let them be who they are. And we had to, and then the question is, okay, how do I, how do I give them the space? Okay. And then like a, a bit into it, I realized, okay, I'm going to have them read out. I'm going to, when I do the audio count for the audio person, sound person, I'm going to ask them to go from one whispering to 10 yelling. So we don't really need them to yell. But if you yell in the space, you start to own it, right? When I give feedback, I always tell the directors myself, you kneel and you look up at them. You kneel and you look up because that's giving them the authority. You're not, you, it's, what I learned from filmmaking, especially documentaries, well, what I learned from documentary filmmaking is that because I tr would travel the world. I mean, I made a film called Americana where I literally travel the world. I traveled to Cuba and I was there for only 12 days and I made a film. I didn't know anybody there. I didn't know. I found the story. I got the actors. I made the film, short film, went to Sundance. I went to Laredo, Texas, five days with another great filmmaker, Eduardo Mayen. Five days, didn't know anything. Met people, talked to people, put them in situations, made a film, went to Sundance the next year. I didn't know what I was going to make. I just knew the question was, you know, and then open to it and go with the flow. And I remember one of my friends in Cuba, he said, Topaz, aren't you a little hubris? You just showed up here with a camera you've never used, you've never been to Cuba before. I'm like, oh my God, he's right. This is ridiculous. This is crazy. But I just had the faith and trusted. And I made a film called America Around the World. It was the year that Obama got elected. That was my contribution was make a film that explores American identity in a global perspective. And what's at risk is young men's lives who are going off to war. So I would go, I went to Vietnam, I went to Hiroshima, Cuba, Serbia, all the, Laredo, Texas, exploring American identity. And the core story that you always return to was two kids in high school, senior year, graduating, going to the military. Because we can all talk about what it means to be American, but at the end of the day, these two boys are going to get on the first flight in their lives, transatlantic, go to a country they've never been to, get a driver license so they could drive a Humvee so they can go and fight. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. And I want to make a film about that. It's called Americana. And I did that by trusting the signs and following and trusting humanity and talking to people and creating spaces where they could express themselves. So you've, you've openly admitted that you, you often have imposter syndrome. You don't know what the hell you're doing. In a lot of these situations. Yeah, I love your, I checked out your Instagram, was it yesterday? And the one that's up right now, I don't know if this is going to be released, but it says, if you don't have imp imposter syndrome, you're not on your edge or something. So yeah, if you're yeah. not, if you don't feel it, then go on your edge and feel it. And I think, yeah, I mean, look, the most work I've had to do in the last six months before this book came out was to um, work on myself in terms of like that voice. It's like, you're a narcissist. Why do you have anything to add? Why should you go on a sh Like, I've been doing this, Kindy. This is our 10th, 11th year. This is the first time that I'm putting a face to the project. Because mm -hmm. it's always been, it's not about me. It's about the conversations. It's about the participants. It's about their courage to step up and share their story. That's what it's about. But if I need to put a face to it so I can help sell a book, because the book is going to help people have better conversations in their lives, to help listen to each other, then I'll do that. Because I know that the end point is better conversations better relationships, better relationships, better world, right. better world for my kids to grow up in. That's, that's what I'm about right now. So one more question about, about that is skin deep. Um, what advice, what sage advice did you ignore when you were starting that? So, okay. When I was starting, or, uh, the thing that comes to mind is not necessarily when I was starting it. It was evolving. I'm sure people were telling you, hey, do you really want to scale it, grow it, da 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 da? You need to do this. Okay. So I've heard that. Have you heard the term ask hole? No. Like not asshole, but ask hole. Huh? I'm an ask. I was an ask hole and I'm hopefully not anymore, but I definitely was in Philly. But who would ask people for advice and then ignore it? Exactly. That's an <laughs> ask hole. It's like someone who asks, asks, oh, do you think I should do it? And then you don't do it. They're like, dude, why am I, why are you even asking? Because I'm going to give you advice and you're not going to do it. You know, and I have, I have been very fortunate to find mentors who basically tell me what's going to happen. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And then it happens, you know? Um, 
So there's a lot of advice that I didn't listen to. Um, what, 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 which one would you like to know about that? <laughs> uh, whichever what, what do you think is most valuable. Whichever one worked out in your favor, you ignored it and it worked out. There's, here's two things. So we, I told you the story about on the Saturday, the guy pulled out the money yep. and I called my friends and investors. Now keep in mind, these are friends and family. There's about six, seven, eight of them. They're listing the acknowledgements of the book. They've already supported me in my short films. They never saw their money back. And here I was coming in with this bigger idea. Thank God I have been fortunate enough to have people with financial agency who can support kid who had an idea. I wasn't even a kid then. I was 37. I was, you know, I was a young man. I was a man. And I called them up and they said, Topaz, if you believe in this idea, I do. They pretty much all said that. They're like, this is up to you. We got you. Like we believe in you. But that, okay. So to me, that means you were able to tell them a story that they were able to buy into. So you got to talk about that. Like okay. what how do you, for someone out there who wants to raise money, so how do you this? That? Okay. All right. This is going to sound ridiculous. This is going to sound very, maybe this could sound arrogant. But when I was talking about the skin deep, I was showing them a, a proof of concept of video that I had made for another project about a war photographer where I mixed documentary footage seamlessly with fiction where people would watch it and be like, what the fuck is this? This is incredible. I don't get it. What is it? Then I had to do an explainer video to explain what they were seeing. So when I just made that to make a feature film um, that I've been working on, so I had to make that to explain the idea behind the film. So then when I was launching the Skin Deep, it was around the same time where I was launching the Skin Deep and I talked about what this thing was, people didn't get it. So then I would point to the proof of concept and say, listen, do you remember 18 months ago when I was talking about the video that I was going to make for the script? Like, yeah. Did you understand what I was talking about then? No. When you watch this, is this not incredible? And now you get it? Yeah. Okay. So the same thing is happening right now when I'm talking about the skin deep. You don't get it now, but it's going to be epic. It's going to be value offering. So that's what you're investing in. And it's not the story. It's not the pitch. It's remember I was 37, 38. These people know me. I've spent time with them. Right, their family and friends, they were investing in me. That's why when they, they were saying, Topaz, if you believe in this and you're going to go on it, go for it. Now, it wasn't tons of money. We're not talking, I'm not, I'm not in the game of, you know, series A, B, C. I'm not, that's a different kind of pressure. This is the pressure of asking your friends and family for money. And at some point, they said no because, you know, company was planning, finding a business model, da, da, da. You know, we've gone through about, two or three deaths where I had to let everyone go, which is super painful, and then build it up again. And you go to your friends when you need the money, otherwise the company's going to die. You have to fire people. And, you, and at some point they say no. And that's when the thought came up for me, Topaz, I'm not equating them the same, but in some sense it's being an addict, like a gambling addict or a drug addict. It's like You keep going to your friends, at some point they got to say no and you got to figure it out yourself. You got to figure out how to make this business model sustainable. You got to figure out how to, you got to change your behavior so that you can make this thing sustainable, resiliently, make the impact. Like you, you have to learn things you don't know. You know, day four or five, I'm talking to the lawyer about, do we going to agree to a C Corp, a B Corp, an S Corp? What are we doing? And he goes, Topaz. I was going to, well, what about these like Topaz? My rate is $350 an hour. You want to pay me to teach you that where you can go learn on Google? Okay, thank you. And I remember feeling so uncomfortable and so scared going great. Because at some point I won't be uncomfortable scared because I'm going to learn this shit. And that the whole journey for me has been from artist and artist, my artist, my kind of artist was value offering. What am I building that offers value regardless of the money to businessman who's like, okay, this needs to be sustainable. What does sustainable mean? And I did a substitution for profit Right? I used to have an issue with money. You know, I didn't like to work for money because I felt, well, they own me. And my therapist one day said, well, Topaz, if they're paying you for your time, don't you own them? Because they're paying you for your time. I said, okay, wait. So let me do a substitution here. Money, profit. Profit is excess energy. You put something out in the world that has, has you put energy into something, you release it in the world, it offers value, 
And then it comes back to excess energy. That excess energy, some people call profit. Then what does that mean? That means that then you can, you have more energy to build more, to put more stuff out in the world, to create more support, to more value. Oh, okay, cool. I can get that game. I can get behind that game. So um, how did you make money? How, what was the business model for, for the skin deep? Uh, it took us, uh, till, it took us what, four years to figure it out. And my friend asked, what's one piece of advice that I didn't listen to? I should have. My friend, Justin Thompson, he's got a video with me on just doing the end. It was so much fun. That's awesome. Yeah. So I did it with him 16 years. I said, Justin, what should I do? He's like, sell car games. And I'm like, like you're not in your cyber thing. Yeah. But we're, we're before we're two years before we're not really strangers. Right. And, um, he goes, sell the card games. So make, and I'm like, Tope, you don't understand, Justin. I'm creating interactive design, interactive 2.0, the media, this, that, 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 long diatribe. Finally, 2018, after having to let people go that were on board, that are family, that are, these people are incredible souls. They're also listening to the acknowledgements of the book. The company, Skin Deep, would not be anything without their time commitment. Had to let them go. Me and one other guy, Nick D'Agostino, doing it. He did everything. He was making content. Shipping for USPS, these car games, we went e-commerce style. And that's, that's now how we make money. It's just e-commerce, we sell car games. And when I met my wife in 2018, and I came in, um, you know, we met her, I met her at her home and friends, it was a thing. She goes, so what do you do? Instead of a five minute diatribe, of interactive media and da, 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 it was like, I sell questions. Right? And there's a process I think we go at. It's like, what's your core offering? Don't talk this big stuff. Like, what's the thing? The thing is I sell questions. That was then. Now I think it's evolving. And I'm constantly asking myself, what is it? And how can I keep it simple? Right? Um, my wife, by the way, said, that's sexy. She was like, that, how many people do you meet? Like, sell, cool. sell, what is this guy about? Like, boy, sell. So that helped me get two kids, an incredible wife. I'm a lucky man. <laughs> you know? Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. All right. So you've got a million subs on your YouTube channel. Um, you just relocated. You just took a leap of faith and moved to Uruguay. Where are we now? What's going on today? Are you still filming? How do people get involved? They want to participate in this. Oh yeah. Um, are you going back? Are you commuting? Back? Oh yeah. I'm commuting back. I'm coming back to Austin. We're filming in Austin. I'm not sure when this is out, but we're filming the 13th and 14th in Austin. Uh, looks like we're going to film in London in July for the first time, which we're really excited about. Um, they can, you can look. The skindeep.com is where you find us. All our social media handles are the skin deep, basically. Um, we have a newsletter called The Bridge. You follow that. Um, the two biggest questions I'm asking in my life is how can I apply what we've learned in this beautiful format of the end and the work we do at the skin deep to have greater impact and support to people? And the other question I ask is what environments and how can I, experiences can I give my children so that I can raise them in a way that prepares them for a world that we really don't know what it's going to be like? Beautiful, man. Well, I always like to loop these conversations back around to childhood. I don't really know exactly how they connect, but I try to just go with the first thing that comes to mind. And when I think back to the little topaz ripping pages out of a book, it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know? And I think that what you're doing now is you're taking uh, something that we very much have convention around, which is conversations, question asking, and you're kind of, you're ripping that apart and you're, you're restructuring it in a way that gives a lot more meaning, um, to people's experience and it helps them to connect more. So you're kind of helping them reattach those pages in a way that kind of suits their own experience. And I think that's beautiful. And I am, um, Excited to continue exploring your platform and your work and your book. And hopefully one of these days, 
uh, getting a chance to cross paths paths with you in person. And I'm sure we'll have a lot more to talk about. So thank you again for coming on to my podcast and um, sharing so openly and vulnerably. And I'm grateful that you're out in the world doing the work that you do. You know, the world needs more people like us, people who are following the thing that lights them up inside, which for you happens to be facilitating these conversations and asking these questions. So thanks for sharing your wisdom with us. Man, thank you. Right. Thank you so much. You know, one of your books or videos talks about how, or you mentioned like you don't believe in this like time, linear time. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, am I wrong? I, I hit impression. I'm not sure where that book is, but you mentioned that. And I just say, we've already met. Mm, mm, we've mm. already met in just the future. Just, we haven't experienced that meeting yet. In it feels like that, honestly, like just even having this conversation feels like you and I are already friends. We just need to, you know, mm. do a Quinn Tarantino and go back to the beginning. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just want to thank you for the platform and the space and the conversation and the questions and your reflection. And I'm really honored. I am really honored to meet your soul and have a conversation in this context. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.